hey, let's bring in our friend from the St. Louis Post Dispatch, Derek Gould, joining us right now. And before we get to the Cardinals, Derek, I'll ask you the question too. <laughs> After that mishap, the technical difficulties in in this 2023 world where we can't get someone on a line, um, I could. <laughs> one in space but we can't get otani for a few minutes by the way i'm on a they, fucking cruise ship i'm literally right. on a cruise ship right now and i'm doing just fine yeah and you're doing the show so Wait derek the if they had rescheduled that mvp conversation for the next day would you have made time out of your off-season schedule to join that conference call for a few minutes because let's be real there were no technical difficulties yeah i think dozens and dozens of reporters would have they would have wanted to hear from Otani uh, about winning the award. Sure, there would have been questions about that, but also just on the eve of going into free agency. So yeah, everybody, everybody would have made time for that conversation, you bet. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. I expected. All right, so um, let's start with the Lance Lynn signing for the St. Louis yeah. Cardinals, because for the record, we reached out to you before the signing, and mm -hmm. we were like, gotta have Derek on today. Perfect timing. What do you think of the beginning of free agency for the Cardinals so far? Yeah, well, they wanted to get certainty in innings. That was one thing that they wanted to start with was somebody who they know could start and bring some balance to their rotation before they then go out to look for additional starters. And Lance certainly does that. And he adds the added element of returning here. Um, it's kind of been the theme of the day, to be honest. They're starting Thanksgiving week by bringing a whole bunch of people back um, for reunions because – Daniel Descalso is going to be the bench coach here. So members of that 11 team, I probably should text a whole bunch of them to see. AJ, are you coming back? Are you are you on your way back to the, the Cardinals? Just as, I can just I ask you live. You just stole both of my questions. <laughs> Derek, I had two questions. Well, I was in St. Louis, what, 10 days ago, whatever it was. Uh, yeah. And people were like, what is he there for? And it was not for anything good. Uh, I mean, other than yeah. it was a celebration of life for Tim McCarver, which was, I mean, obviously an awesome. But my two questions were, why Lance and how happy is, you know, Lance to be coming back? And then two, why the fuck they hired Daniel Scalso as bench coach? I mean, I'm sitting here texting with him right now. He's like bench coach. And I'm like, wait, what? You're the bench coach? Bet the under right now on the Cardinals for next year. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, bringing back infielders to be bench coach has kind of worked out for them pretty well, right? The, the previous guy – who had played for the Cardinals. Well, I guess Joe McEwen played for the Cardinals too, but the previous guy from that era who played infield, who came back to the Cardinals, um, was the National League Manager of the Year. So it, it's kind of worked out for uh, for the folks like that. I, I, you know, I think um, for Lance, you know, it's a chance to be close to home. He's got a place in Southern Illinois um, that he lives, so this is a chance to be close to home, familiar. Um, for the Cardinals, you know, they want to add some kind of, grit and i know aj and i've kind of talked about this before because he was described as the rusty nail you know a no-nonsense starter who's going to give you innings you know that's that's kind of what they wanted and they wanted to start there and build from there and lance certainly brings that um you know he he's a guy who you know it, it seemed like a quick match a quick move that they can make and it gives the cardinals a start on their off season to answer your scott's question earlier um but not a finish you know this is the this is the beginning of what they need to kind of reform that rotation and rebuild it. Um, and they do so by getting innings. And, and that's, that's a pretty good bedrock to start. It's a place where they've lacked um, in recent years is just getting those innings. So you're saying that the Cardinals love only infielders as their bench coach because <laughs> no. I saw where John Jay interviewed, yeah, interviewed for the, the Cubs. Cubs job bench coach yeah. and he didn't get it. And so now we have a friendly rivalry because John Jay and Daniel Descalso are literally best friends. So oh, now yeah, we have no, a budding no. rivalry of bench coach, you know, so now I can give Jay shit for not getting it and Daniel got it ahead of him. So you're saying that the Cardinals are anti-outfielders as bench coach, only infielders can do it. I don't believe I said that at all. No, um, I, I think <laughs> I'm being a little bit misquoted here to say something you told me <laughs> once that they're being misquoted. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I, you know, it's just that. It's the way the kind of positions have gone. Um, yeah, you're you're right about that. John and uh, and and Daniel are really close friends. They they just got back from a vacation together a little bit, or at least a trip together. Um, you know, they keep in touch. They talk about what it would be like to be on the same staff. Um, what I think is really interesting about Descalso coming back, um, and it, and it does mirror a little bit about with Schumacher, Skip Schumacher coming back, is he went elsewhere. Um, you know, the Cardinals have had and you know this aj they're they're pretty they've been pretty they like their continuity and they like that consistency 
And that continuity can sometimes just breed sameness. They can be in a silo. This is how the Cardinals do things. They hire within the silo. They promote within the silo. Um, Descalso has that Cardinal background just in the same way Lance Lynn does, just in the way Schumacher does. But they've also been elsewhere. Um, you know, Descalso recently worked with the Diamondbacks, has been a part of that front office and, you know, got to spend some time with them, see how they do things. Uh, I think there's a real benefit to bringing folks from the outside, especially for the Cardinals at this point in time where they know that they've fallen behind in some really key categories and need to catch up. Um, pitching is a part of that. And that's kind of what's next is what are they going to do with their pitching development? What's what's on the horizon? Um, actually, what's on the immediate horizon for what they want to do? You know, they talked to Heim Bloom, for example, um, among some other executives about being involved as an advisor at some point or in some capacity, just to look over it and give them an outside viewpoint of where they could tighten things up and uh, and get back to the edge um, that they had for a long time. And that's part of my next question is, what is next? Uh, you got Lance Lynn. Uh, mm -hmm. what's next for this team? Are they going to look for another bat? Or are they going to look for another, you know, a nice free agent pitcher again? I mean, they, they can do it. So it, it's a matter of what they want to do next. Where do you see them pulling from which angle here? Pitching, pitching, pitching. And specifically, that's the line that Mosaic has said often. So that's one pitcher down. They were telling agents and media there at the GM meetings that they wanted to add two and a half pitchers. What they meant by that is two certainties, two guys who can give volume innings, um, can be a part of the rotation. And then the half could be a guy who has a split role, a swing man, or somebody who's looking to bounce back or one year, two year deal who's trying to come back and, and kind of rebuild value, either coming back from injury or coming back from inconsistent performance. Somebody with high upside who they can take that kind of reach on because they know they're getting the innings from the two previous guys that they added. They have, um, for the most part, really focused on starting pitching. And that continues with the idea that they'll add some relievers later on. Um, you know, they, they got a pretty long list of relievers that they'll at least explore. Um, and they are trying to find both free agent starters and explore the trades possibilities for starters. Um, you know, they were talking about trades here not too long ago with the non-tender deal. Um, and they still have some that they'll entertain um, to see if they can add a starter in that direction too. But the focus right now is on pitching. You mentioned a bat there. Um, they think their everyday lineup is what they call it. The, the, they think their everyday lineup is pretty good offensively, and they can kind of rest on that. You know, when when Brendan Donovan was healthy this past year, they were a top seven, top eight uh, lineup. When they have Brendan Donovan, when they have Lars Newpar in that lineup, and they're not on the injured list, they're they're a good, deep, versatile lineup, um, and they have all that group coming back. They just need the pitching to support it. Now, do you think uh, Matthew Libator is a top five guy for them? You see him coming on strong. I play with him uh, mm -hmm. with Team USA. He was phenomenal yeah. with us. Bright young star, kind of goofy in his own little way, you know, just trying to get into his body. But he, he's a bulldog for sure. Yeah, you know what? They learned a lot about him, and it was somewhat interesting. Well, it was a lot interesting because, okay, so they have Zach Thompson and Matthew Libator, right? Two lefty pitching prospects, two guys who are coming up. Zach Thompson earns a spot in the bullpen in spring training, and they're like, okay, well, we'll see how this relief goes. But they really saw Matthew Libertor as a starter, and how do you get more from him? How do you get that sustained velocity from him as a starter? He goes out there and just like fueled by adrenaline and all the work he did, pitches this gem against his former team, the Rays, has that sustained velocity, has that result, has that thing, and may really makes a stride there as a starter. And then within, say, a month, the two of them had switched places. Thompson was in the rotation, and they were taking this look out of curiosity and also out of need of Libertor as a lefty reliever. Was that a place where his velocity really played up and sustained and a, something that he could do? Because he, he is a guy who throws every day. His arm rebounds well. It's always been something that he's done well. So did that fit in the bullpen? And by the end of the season, you know, they were really intrigued by what he had done out of the bullpen in that lefty kind of position. And they were starting to see like what Zach Thompson could do if given more innings as a starter role. Um, you know, they'll both get a chance to come to spring training, you know, ready to be starters. They're both working now. Zach Thompson went straight from the season into some more pitching and some more uh, work um, in Charlotte, I believe, because he wanted to pitch um, into October as if the Cardinals had made the postseason and wanted to continue to kind of evaluate, okay, where his mechanics were, what things he could do, and wanted to do that 
before he took a rest, um, almost to simulate a postseason. And, you know, Libertor is working with like, OK, here are the things that you did strength wise, conditioning wise or oh, between star wise to really help himself. And how does that fit either help him make his bid stronger to be a starter or really have this kind of, I guess, reinvention as a, as a reliever that could be a real factor for them with the stuff he has. So really intriguing spot for them. They want those guys to come to compete for a starter job, not to be counted on for a starter job. Um, but we'll see if they make the moves enough to have that be possible. So Derek, are they going to play at the top of the market for the starters that are left? And that could include a trade as well, because mm-hmm. there are some big yeah. names available, but one of the, um, our fans, Justin in the chat said, how close were they? to signing Aaron Nola, because at least one of the reports we saw from Scott Lauber of the Philly Inquirer listed the Dodgers is putting an offer out there that was pretty healthy. The Braves putting an offer out there. I didn't see him say anything on St. Cardinals Louis. Did not. I think they did not. They did, okay. they did so not make an offer. No. Are they going to play for one of the big boys? I mean, there's not that many. You're looking at, in that category, Snell, Yamamoto, Jordan Montgomery, Sonny mm-hmm. Gray. So maybe those four. Are they going to play yeah. for one of those four? And if not, Cease, Glass now, um, Corbin Burns. Because after that, I think fans would be pretty pissed off if they're getting guys that are labeled more as fours and fives. Yeah, yeah, and, and the fans would have every right to be, right? Like this is a team that said that they wanted to rebuild and rebuild fast and reclaim their spot in the division as a contender. And the quickest, most expedient way to do that is through pitching. And they happen to be doing that at a time when there is – a handful of pitchers who will help them. Um, you know, internally they see Sonny Gray as a clear fit, you know, a guy who um, lives in Nashville. If he wants some proximity close to home, they realize that the competition, and it seems like that's the case is with the Braves. Um, and, you know, they seem like they could, they feel like they could offer him a compelling thing. I'm not sure as of like this moment, 144 PM where things stand with that. Um, but they at least going into this and going into conversations felt like they could at least make a compelling offer for him. Um, I'm really intrigued with all the work that they've put in over the last year plus to build towards making more competitive offers for players coming from Japan. Um, you know, particularly, obviously, Yamamoto is in that. You know, the Cardinals have had a business arrangement um, working relationship with Oryx which is where Yamamoto is coming from. They obviously have Lars Newtbar on their staff, who has been very honest and open about how much a fan he is of Yamamoto and how close they became through the WBC. Um, There's a lot of things putting the Cardinals, giving the Cardinals a seat at the table to have that conversation. Now, whether or not they're going to break from character and make a big splash offer, we'll see. Um, if it's if they're ever going to do it for a starting pitcher, I, the question I've asked is, is it the 25-year-old? That, that, you know, would be the one that fits their really conservative, really risk adverse model that they've used in the past. I think that's really intriguing for this team as to they've put in all the groundwork um, and it goes beyond the two things that I, I mentioned, but they put in a lot of groundwork to be ready to make a competitive offer. Do they actually do that? Um, and then the, the blanket answer to like the trade possibilities that you mentioned is yes, 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 yes. They, they're going to try to explore um, as much as they can with this. You know, what do they have to offer is a bigger question. Um, this isn't the farm system that it used to be, um, but they still feel like they have some depth of hitters that could make for um, compelling matches with some of the starters that are out there. It's how they outfit a deal. But yeah, I mean, these are these are all the avenues and roads that they're exploring. Um, and it, it's it's just a, it is possible that they just don't find the fit or they come up shy, or they talk themselves out of deals, which they've done in the past. But the need is clear. The opportunity is clear. The due diligence that they use, that phrase that they use is clear. Um, So now it's just a matter of, look, they're at the edge of the diving board. Do they take the leap? And and that brings my next question, because first and foremost, you got to win your division. And in the Central, Mm -hmm. when I played there, it was the Cardinals. Cardinals, Cardinals, Cardinals. Kind of mm-hmm. took a little dip, came back up, and now they're, they've fallen again. They have to compete in the Central, and I, and I think right now they don't have the team to do it, and I think they need to get a couple more pieces, of course. But do you think that's like the main goal? I know everybody wants to win a World Series, but for them, they win that division. That's a plus because the Central, they, there's some battles going on in the Central. I remember playing there from the Cubs to the Brewers to the Reds and, and um, Pirates. I guess they're coming up, but still. 
I think that has to be their first and foremost, their goal. Yeah, I'd be intrigued to get like your all's opinion on this because one of the things the Cardinals ran into is the change of schedule with less games against the Reds, less games against the Pirates, less less games against these teams that they not only were competing head to head with for so long, um, but in some cases because they were re- rebuilding, were able to take advantage of. So yeah, the Cardinals still have kind of their model geared towards and their conversation geared towards. And, you know, the front office talks about its goal is geared towards winning the division. Um, but I'm, I wonder, and I, I love like to hear you guys' thoughts on this, is do they need to dial that up a little bit? Because, you know, the balanced schedule is changing that. And, you know, what is to stop the Cardinals from saying, you know what, it's not just about winning the division anymore. It's about finishing in the top two spots. It's about thinking about being a National League Titan, not a flyover country Titan. That's a great question because, I mean, to, re- to rephrase it like that, because you got to play everybody now, and you're only, what is yeah. it, nine games? Is that what is that my mistake? Or 10? No, it's 14. 14? 14. In the division? I yeah, mean, so but it was losing, 19. Yeah, you're losing five. I, but five per team. I so understand. 20 I, games. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think 14 still is a good amount, mm-hmm. um, and everybody's doing the same thing. But at the same token, you might play that, you know, say you're the Cardinals, you might play the Yankees when they got three injuries, and then the Reds yeah. might play them when they're at full strength. So yeah. it's just a pay, it's a flip of a coin. So I, I, I still like it, but at the same time, you know, is it fair? No, nothing's fair in this world. You know, I think it's it fair. Goes. I love it. I think it's yeah. fair. I think it just was a shock for the Cardinals to not have those games to get fat yeah. on. You know, yeah, they had no, to, no doubt. They when, got when it was, Yeah, when it was usually out of those other five games against four other opponents, that's 20 games, they're taking mm-hmm. at least 13 or 14 of those. It, no doubt about it. Yeah, that yeah. hurts. Yeah. Yeah, you don't yeah. get to let let other people pick on the pirates for once. Jeez, come on, <laughs> everybody picks on the pirates. So, so Derek, let's finish with this. What's mm-hmm. what's the pulse in St. Louis right now from fans? Because obviously they've had a lot of success for a while, and we see this with the Yankee fans too. Now the Cardinals have won more recently a World Series than the Yankees, but you expect greatness every year. So when you have a year like this, where they really weren't even in the conversation for the playoffs for a while, obviously yeah. all hell breaks loose. So are they pinning a lot of their anger towards ownership and spending, front office and decisions, manager and decisions on field, players and just not having the pitching? Like, where do you see a lot of the blame going and the, the outcries right now? I mean, it's all of it. I mean, it's a, you, if you want to, you can find fans who <laughs> they might list all of those in their uh, in their complaints. Um <laughs> Uh, it, and they might not offer an order or you can ask seven different fans and you'd get seven different orders of, of those things. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of frustration that all stems from the style of baseball that they played, you know, the absolute trap door of pitching that they fell into. It just undermined everything. And you, you guys all know what a, what it does to a team as far as how it looks on the field. Um, you know, they talked a lot about how, you know, going into games and they're down four nothing after one or two innings, just what that does to kind of the vibe around a ballpark or a vibe around a team. Um, so that that was something that stood out to fans. Um, and then, of course, they have, um, you know, a postseason where they're looking at, um, you know, Adolis Garcia as the ALCS MVP just a few years after Randy Rosarena is the ALCS MVP. Um, you know, they see Jordan Montgomery thrive with the Texas Rangers. Um, they saw the, the, the gentleman who was on your program before me, um, you know, a, a St. Louis area guy, Mizzou great, Max Scherzer, who the Cardinals have not really ever pursued or really ever gone to the table to try to sign as a free agent or trade for him. And he's there again as a champion. Um, you know, I think that, you know, that Cardinal fans see what could have been every year through the lens of that postseason. And this year it was heightened by the fact that the Cardinals weren't there to offer, you know, a challenge to it. They weren't playing in October. So they kind of yielded the whole stage to former Cardinals and this question of what could have been. Um, so that that's kind of created this heightened sense um, that adds to the annual want of every fan base. They want their team to make a splash. And when the team is expected to win, they want that team to be a big splash. Um, you know, Cardinal fans have seen a lot of success, that run of winning seasons. Um, this past season was the first losing season with Moselock in charge of baseball at the top of baseball operations. 
Um, and they, and it, it hit like a thunder punch to this group, to the fans who felt like all their concerns were validated by this losing season. They'd seen the team regress year by year. They'd seen it hold, hold tr- tight to past practices while other teams sped past them. They'd seen players from their roster not get opportunities here, but then shine elsewhere, whether it's Zach Gallen, another guy who was in the World Series, or Sandy Alcantara, a former Cy Young winner. They see all this, what could have been, and they wonder, okay, well, where's the great leap for the Cardinals to get back to what they need to be? Enough of the what could have been, get back to what you're supposed to be. Yeah, it's a good call. I mean, the fans support this team so, so hardcore every single year. We all know they're making plenty of money to be able to handle a big free agent signing. So hopefully we'll have you on and we talk about Yamamoto or something like that. So Derek, uh, have a great holiday. Yeah, exactly. I I hope so, man. I hope someone like that ends up there. I think it'd be really cool. Um, Have a great holiday, dude. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. I got some former Cardinals to check in on apparently to see if they're returning for Thanksgiving. So thanks, guys. Yes, please do. He's (laughs) on it. Thanks, Derek. (laughs) Thank you. Cheers, man.